All right. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CFPR lunchtime seminar. And trust that you are keeping well. Uh, it's almost the end of term here at NUS, and uh, many of us and uh, would be busy with grading. So thank you for taking the time uh, to be here with us today. Today it is our privilege to have uh, Professor Tang Ling Ling uh, share with us her research. Uh, let me say a few words by way of introduction. Prof Tang is Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Japanese Studies at NUS, as well as Co-Director of the Next Age Institute uh, in FASS. She is a social cultural anthropologist by training uh, with research interests in aging, intergenerational approaches and relationships, as well as family and migration uh, with, with a focus on Asia. She publishes widely in her areas of expertise and is co-editor in chief of the Journal of Intergenerational Relationships. Her most recent work is entitled Intergenerational Contact Zones, Place-Based Strategies for Promoting Social Inclusion and Belonging, which is also the title of her presentation today. Uh, the book is co-edited uh, with Kaplan, Sanchez and Hoffman and published by Rod Latch in 2020. So Prof Tang will yes. speak for about half an hour, uh, after which we proceed with Q&A, uh, where I will invite the audience to pose your questions to Prof Tang in person by unmuting yourselves. So without further ado, uh, Prof Tang, please. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for um, taking your time to attend this seminar. And my thanks to CFPR for inviting me to give a talk to introduce intergenerational contact zones about the book and the concept. So as uh, said earlier, this is the book that was published in 2020 uh, by um, a team of us, Dr. Kaplan, uh, Sanchez and Dr. Hoffman. Uh, we are longtime colleagues and good friends in the field of intergenerational studies. And, um, and we, as you know, we come from four corners of the world. And I always treasure this special connections that we have through our passion in intergenerational work. So the title of this talk is uh, same as the book title, Intergenerational Contact Zones, which I will call ICZ, Place-Based Strategies for Promoting Social Inclusion and Belonging. So today's session is really an introduction to the concept of ICZ and to explore how the concept could be regarded as a tool, a strategy for promoting intergenerational connections. And ICZ is all about social engagements, but the book came out at an awkward time because I, it reached me in March, 2020 when COVID just started to hit the world and social distancing became the buzzword. So we actually didn't do much in promoting the book um, last year. But we know that uh, with, with um, global population aging and increasing awareness of undesirable consequences of age segregation in, this, in the recent years, globally, we are seeing an increased interest, innovation, and dissemination of intergenerational programs and practices. And by intergenerational programs and practices, I have the definition here from Beth Johnson Foundation um, to bring, to define it as bringing people together in purposeful, mutually beneficial activities, which promote greater understanding and respect between generations and contribute to building more cohesive communities and it's building on the positive resources that the young and old have to offer each other and those around them. IG programs, um, I call it in short forms, are mostly about bringing together old and young that are not biologically related. Um, usually the programs are not for family members. I mean, usually, but of course, you know, it'd be good if grandparents can join in as well. Um, but of course, you know, from my experience as editor in the Journal of Intergenerational Relationships, how to connect grandparents and grandchildren is also um, very important and of much scholarly interest as well. From where I started developing my interest in intergenerational programs 30 years ago, we have seen encouraging growth in the field from studying impact of 
IG programs on participants' health, social relationships, sense of self-fulfillment, identity forming, etc., to establishing standards and guidelines for effective practice in um, the IG field and so forth. However, it always makes me wonder, what more is there to bring the generations together? Are we missing anything? So the idea of ICZ came out somewhat from the feeling that it's not enough to just focus on programming. In the programming domain, there seems to be a lagging inattention to the environment, be it a built, natural, virtual, that there is not enough connection with how the environment has a bearing on program planning process and outcomes. Programming is definitely important, but beyond programs, how is intergenerational setting that works are created? So when, when we talk about, or when we add environment into this intergenerational programs and uh, intergenerational field, then um, we are also exploring ICZ framework um, building on earlier works that focus on the role of physical design and environment in intergenerational engagements. So I have here some of the works that, I mean, there are a lot of good works out there. These are some of the works that we refer to, uh, to look at, you know, um, on how the physical design and environment um, are related to intergenerational engagements. So for example, Manchester and Faces work on uh, relearning cities for intergenerational engagements. Uh, this report on the relations in uh, urban space, um, Vanderbilt and Worth um, volume on intergenerational space um, report, looking at the intentional intergenerational neighboring model. And Amy Kyota, who has been to Singapore quite a few times, most of you may be familiar with her, um, her Ibasho Cafe model for creating a elder-led community resources and intergenerational connections. And Generations United uh, is a key organization in promoting intergenerational bonding in the US and also has recent publications on intergenerational shared sites. In fact, intergenerational shared sites is like one of the most um, closed and you know things that we refer to when we look at ICZ as well. And they have two publications out there, which presents profiles of uh, model intergenerational shared sites, highlighting ways in which they reduce ageism, remove age segregation barriers, providing strategies, for boosting the number of intergenerational shared sites as well. Then um, that's also uh, a very recent work on age inclusive public place by Hardwicka and Serena, which is more of a design um, principles kind of book. And of course, um, out there we have a big chunk of literature that's looking at age friendly communities and cities. And I think all this are uh, important um, in helping us to understand more about environment and intergenerational connections. Um, so ICZ were built upon the literature and that, um, and we feel that coming from the intergenerational programs field, we, the ICZ could serve as a sensitizing tool in exploring ways to enable the creation of effective and meaningful settings for desired intergenerational encounters. So following now uh, from the introduction, I would like to look into three main areas. Uh, the first part, I will be talking about definition, background and development, and then I will uh, look into the book as the data for the presentation, um, talking about um, two examples from library, public library and care homes, and then to also um, move into more discussion on developing effective ICZ. What are some of the principles and lessons learned? Okay, so let's move on to the first um, area. So we have with us the working definition of ICZ as, the, as following, um, that it serves as spatial focal points for different generations to meet, interact, build relationships, trust and, relation, and, and friendships, and if desired, working together to address issues of local concerns. So um, it's, well, on old and young, but really, you know, we are trying to also look at a different, across the spectrum on relationships, on generations as, as well. And we look at ICZ spaces as um, really anywhere can become ICZ spaces if 
people are sensitized to it. Uh, so they can be found in all kinds of community settings, schools, senior centers, retirement communities, museums, community gardens, and so forth. And many of this space probably did not set up to be intergenerational in the first space, in the first instance, but we are arguing that they all have potential to become ICC spaces. Now, the background, um, before I discuss further, I just want to talk a little bit about how this concept came about. It actually came about from this <clears throat> background, <clears throat> this playground. Uh, I don't know any of you uh, have familiar or look, have known this playground. It's in one of the neighborhoods in Singapore. The concept was uh, first introduced in this chapter that I wrote for uh, Vanderbeck and Wirth, uh, Intergenerational Space in which uh, I was uh, studying the encounters in public spaces in the public housing neighborhoods. Uh, one of the sections I use, actually, I use a lot of Dr. Aileen Wong's uh, 1985 or so um, chapter that looks at the void deck as well as a public space uh, for, for intergenerational encounter. But um, I place quite a bit of focus in this chapter looking at the playground. Um, a co-located playground that's placed next to a fitness corner for older people. And um, I observed that, you know, my, my hypothesis or my um, perception was that, well, maybe there will be more of the intergenerational connections or, you know, um, linkages because they are so close by. Um, then um, with the observation, I thought that, it, well, I realized it's not only for different generations, it's also for residents of different ethnicities to interact. And I term such a site as contact zone and see it as potential. It has the potential of intergenerational contact, um, contact zone, but only potential at that point, because um, although there is intentional um, effort to co-locate you know, from HDB um, design, uh, but it is more of a parallel coexistence, although um, we see potential for relationship building over time. And in general, um, this is important as a place in providing, a, you know, a space for grandparents and grandchildren um, to interact as well. So when I talk about this term contact zone, I, um, this concept of contact zone came from Mary Pratt, who used the term um, in the context of sharing cultures, ideas and values in classroom settings. Essentially, she argues that when people come together from diverse cultural perspective, there is the potential for tension, confrontation, but also space for greater understanding if efforts are made to change the interaction dynamic. So the concept of ICZ runs parallel to that of that cultural contact zones idea, except that in the ICZ case, the emphasis is placed on bridging the diverse generational perspectives and experience. So after this was, um, this article came out in 2015, uh, barely a few months later, my colleagues, Matt Kaplan, and Mariano uh, Yako Hoffman, uh, they, they got excited with the idea. And then they convened a meeting uh, by the Oxford Institute of Population Aging in the same year, in the summer of 2015, where I zoom in. Um, um, no, I, there was no Zoom at that time, so I Skyped in from Singapore. So um, this unique gathering saw a multidisciplinary group of 13 scholars and practitioners engaging in groundwork discussions, collaborative inquiry, to explore the existing ex approaches and charting new strategies for creating or enhancing intergenerational spaces and using ICZ as a framework to, um, for discussion. After that, we published a, a compendium online uh, before we work further towards this book. So the compendium had 13 chapters. Um, they, not all of them were included. Some, most of them were included in this book volume and then we gathered much uh, more, cha uh, more chapters. So we have a total of 25 chapters for this book. So um, one of the outcome of this um, workshop uh, was to further develop this idea of ICZ into multi, multiple dimensional concept. So the dimensions of ICZ framework um, at the end of the discussion, um, 
we expanded to eight dimensions, including physical, temporal, psychological, political, institutional, virtual, ethical, and about justice, uh, equity as well. So um, this is what you can see in the um, chapter in the book that tells you much more details about some of the questions and issues to consider in each uh, dimension. Well, it is important to note that ICZ is not intended to be created simply for adding another term to the already rich and expanding literature on intergenerational practices, but rather to enable a new multi-dimensional conceptual co approach that helps towards desensitization and understanding application, reframing, and situating of intergenerational connections in place. And we are excited that the potential of the ICZ framework as a way to look at the psychosocial spatial environment um, is there and how it enters, um, and also how it enters into um, intergenerational activity experience and vice versa. So um, at the root of, um, how we define ICZ is this basic understanding that physical environment is more than an amalgamation of physical properties. So here I quote from Proshansky that talk about, you know, there's no physical setting that is not also a social and cultural setting. And with this, I want to also briefly differentiate, talk about the space and place and briefly differentiate them. So, um, so we, when we talk about ICZ spaces, we are actually simultaneously alluding to space and place. However, while space in environmental terms has specific physical dimensions, we are primarily concerned with the conversion of a space into a place. So a space may remain a space, um, but it may also become a place as defined by one's emotional feeling and a sense of belonging to the space. So in other chapters, um, in other words, we have talked about space becoming a place uh, when it has a meaning um, for someone. And other scholars have talked about how place can be a space that's imbued with meanings by human experience and how um, we should look at place as a subset of different kinds of spaces for different people, different groups and communities. Uh, and then there's also this concept of built space, talking about how it should be understood as a relational pattern um, and, and the connections, the strong ties that um, built space has to social meaning. Okay, so basically we're talking about meaning making. This whole concept of place perception, place identity, um, and it's important and how it becomes, it has meaning when it changes from my meaning to shared meaning. Okay, so uh, with this, let me move on to the second part of the um, talk that I'm talking about some possibilities with ICZ, looking at the chap some of the chapters. So there are six parts in the book. Um, the chapters are pretty short, like 3000 words. So we, we wanna keep it short so that we can have more varieties and diversities. And also uh, the 25 chapters are diverse in the sense that they're very international, coming from different uh, people from different um, places, different nationalities, different, also besides scholars, we do also have people who are practitioners and so forth. So they are quite different sometimes in um, the kind of, um, the way they, the, the writing and so forth. Um, but we want them to tell us in each chapter um, the kind of learning points they have as well. So some people will write more about learning points um, than others, but um, we did give them a, you know, this guide of um, what we see ICZ as and how they look, look at it, um, how they perceive it and how they expand it. So for part one, it's about uh, regen uh, regeneration of community life. So we have people talking about the kind of gathering places. Uh, and then um, this one is about library that I want to talk a little bit more. Um, and then city cycling spaces play um, and and also this interesting part about imagining a bus stop as an intergenerational contact zone. So 
uh, maybe you can, you know, because bus stop is where people congregate and different generations will congregate. So how can it become a place where there can be uh, relationship building as well? Then part two is about parks and recreation. So this is about open space, public parks and so forth. And then also about gardening programs. Actually, there are a lot of uh, intergenerational programs that are relating related to gardening um, and especially relating to urban gardening as well. Yeah, and then uh, forest and community gardens. And then uh, education settings, looking at schools, how the schools become an intergenerational contact zones. Uh, and for example, um, 14, chapter 14, talking about second language learning in Hong Kong, they brought in uh, older people who are fluent in English, good in English as uh, volunteers to support um, these middle school, secondary school children in the learning of English language and the kind of impact on both. Okay, and then this one is about residential settings and family life. Uh, about care homes, co-housing cool community, senior housing. Um, I talk about um, Japanese teapot with my Japanese um, collaborator. And then we also have a chapter looking at virtual environment. And then part five talks about more of uh, systems itself, the national international con context of things. Mm. And then we also have the last section that's on methods. So. Um, for example, there's this um, toolkit idea, you know, what are some of the strategies, what are some of the tools that you can use to improve um, the uh, ICZ or when you want to set up doing an ICZ. Okay, so uh, there are various things going on, but uh, of course I can't talk about everything. So let me just bring out two, um, okay, two two examples. But uh, before I move on, some of you may wonder, how come there's nothing from Singapore? Well, actually, there's a chap there's a, uh, it's supposed to be 26 chapters. So there was actually supposed to be a chapter from Singapore. But uh, well, I'm not going to tell this, the story is too long to tell about about it. But I just want to say that I do talk about Singapore as an example in other in um, other places in 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 other um, presentations as well. And this is one that um, uh, I had a chapter in the age inclusive public space, uh, where I um, focus on Singapore, and I want to thank uh, URA for um, supporting me in this the writing of this paper. Okay, so first, um, I want to talk about uh, this chapter that talks about library as ICZ. Um, well, if we are asked to think, you know, if you think, where can we create ICZ in the community? Where can we create programs, intergenerational programs? Where are the sites in the community? Uh, I don't know if you agree with me that library actually has very good potential. Um, for doing that because library is a natural congregating place for different generations of people uh, who, of course, uh, with the main um, purpose of um, borrowing books there, read books, newspapers, using computers, or nowadays, our, for example, our community libraries have cafe, people go there for coffee as well. So um, sometimes I think libraries um, perhaps it's much more a natural congregation place than community centers or clubs. And it, it starts to make me wonder why not, you know, why don't, don't, why didn't we have more libraries building together with the CCs you know, for co location? But of course, uh, if you look at our libraries, it's, it's actually, besides books, uh, for boring books or storing books, it's just becoming more of a community hub. It also have exhibitions and you know all kinds of programs for different people, different age groups as well. So here um, I just took it from the National Library Board websites, and they do have uh, all kinds of programs for different age groups. Um, but um, it didn't have any like specific thing that is intergenerational programs. Although I think a lot of programs, for example, for children, they talk about welcoming grandparents. For seniors, like um, seniors tech and read program, you probably also have young people involving as volunteers. So there are um, some form, probably um, most likely some form of intergenerational 
um, kind of approach being inbuilt in these programs as well. So, um, so library was the focus for this chapter um, by Yvonne Ng. Um, Yvonne is in fact a Singaporean living in Canada. She is an artistic director um, for a nonprofit dance organization called Tiger Princess Dance Projects. And uh, she, in this chapter, she discussed about the positive experience of adding an intergenerational component to a dance-based program that she has been running for, I think, 10 years at least for young people from nine to 12 years old. So the chapter talks about, well, generation connecting, about community building, um, about um, the, the community building potential of intergenerational centered together and is this case in this case it is uh, about dance so um, she talks about how you know dance activities a joyful experience and such playful socially oriented and collectively generated atmosphere creates a sense of community where differences doesn't matter and but at the same time the participants still see the you still see respect for the otherness in terms of physical capabilities of each of the participants. And, um, and she observed how you from the very first meeting with the seniors was able to encourage older adults into play and enjoyment and how they have a catalyst, catalytic um, effect for older adults and in promoting intergen, uh, the interaction. And of course, uh, there are also many um, lit in the literature, we also see how dance, the movements, coordinations um, has encouraged, um, is, is actually having very positive health impact uh, for older adults. And um, it, is, it should be promoted in that sense. Um, if you have creative dance module that's suitable for older adults and for the intergenerations. So um, the chapter also has some discussion of practice, practical tips on planning intergenerational dance and community arts program. But the main thing I want to highlight, you know, by telling you about this chapter is how um, public places in community, uh, such as library, you know, um, should be looked into um, in promoting or, you know, to be creative in thinking of how we can expand them into ICC. Um, and how arts, in fact, is a very good medium for engaging with uh, different generations. Okay, and then um, there is this uh, other chapter, quite a few chapters talk about care homes, and it's common, you know, talking about if young people want to interact with older people, where do they go? They go to nursing homes, they go to the care centers for older people, and that's what's happening a lot in Singapore as well. But this chapter by um, Grazinskas and Susan Lanford, uh, it's about an intergenerational program that's called Cocktails in Care Homes. Uh, and it, this is run by an intergenerational arts charity called Magic Me, based in East London in the UK. The program started in 2011 and it, has now, um, it is now in operation in 15 care homes now. So in the UK, care homes refer to residents or nursing homes catering to older adults with a range of needs. Uh, in Singapore, we are also seeing an increase in new nursing home facilities set up, you know, within the housing estate. So I thought it would be useful for us to understand, you know, some of these projects in nursing homes overseas that, um, and also for us to think about, well, you know, whether there's possibility for us to um, look into having some intergenerational programs in that way as well. So what do cocktails program and project do? Uh, this programs, um, operates like this, you know, it's like once a month on a Wednesday or Thursday in the midweek, uh, this cocktail party will start between 6 to 7.30 p.m. in the care home. Then it will be the residents, uh, their family members and friends will be invited. Um, care home staff would also come as well. And then, um, and also volunteers. So the parties will take place within a communal space, often the lounge or dining room in a care home. And then I think what's interesting here is serves alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks and snacks. I think that's probably why it's very attractive because it serves alcoholic drinks as well. 
and perhaps this is UK, so this is the culture. Uh, those attending, you know, were also there will also be sometimes music, um, concerts, little concerts, so forth, um, and maybe you know uh, a dance. So it's more like a party kind of atmosphere. So young people coming here. Um, as volunteers. They are recruited as volunteers. They have to be 18 years or older. Uh, they have to reach the legal age to drink alcohol in the UK. So uh, they come to the parties as guests to socialize with residents and other volunteers as well. And um, so young people will say, okay, I sign up as a volunteer and then they need to be inducted with training from Magic Me, uh, including how to communicate with older adults, you know, how to communicate uh, with those with dementia and so forth. Uh, and it is interesting that the program aims to get volunteers on their way home, to stop into a care home for a drink, have a chat with a resident, rather than go to their local pub. And uh, essentially it opened the door of the care home to the community around it. London is a place where there are many young people who move there. They are not London lights, but they move there for education or work. And they could sometimes find themselves only with their own generation, missing intergenerational contact with older relatives. So a volunteer said, you know, London can feel quite lonely and unfriendly sometimes. This program makes me feel the opposite. I always leave feeling so happy, you know, going to the program. And residents uh, over, the, over the years, because, you know, it has been 10 years. So for some of them who have started like 10 years ago, there's really a relationship that's forming um, as a result of this continuous interaction. Uh, as this resident say, I'm so filled with joy at seeing you again, telling a, uh, a volunteer. I think this program is uh, it's very innovative, you know, um, and, and the idea of the program, in fact, came from an evaluation that Magic Me was doing on an intergenerational arts project with local school children and youth. So they were asking the residents how they find the program so far, and residents say, oh, they like the arts program, but they like to have something in the evening as well, which is the loneliest part of the day for them. The, um, the normal day for care home residents is like, you know, activity coordinators, coordinators will finish work at 5 p.m. Then they will have dinner served at 6 p.m. And then they will go to bed at 7 p.m. And this happens day after day. So, um, so this idea of, oh, you know, one of the evenings at something different is um, an excitement for them. And in the community too, there are, Magic Me is also receiving inquiries uh, from young people wanting to look for volunteer opportunities that's in the evening after work. So, um, so, so this is, um, and over time, there are also cases of cocktails, volunteers, the volunteers doing more by um, teaming up with the company. So someone was working in the law firm and she gets the law firm to do the CSR of um, bringing the care home residents for concerts and so forth. That's beyond, you know, and so they have, because of this, they do have more of the interactions beyond the care home setting. In the final sentence of the chapter, the author say that the benefits of cocktails push the boundary of ICZ beyond the walls of the care homes um, and into the everyday life of younger adults. So, um, I think, you know, examples of innovative examples like this um, is really exciting for us to think about whether there are um, ways that we can adapt it and we can think of um, some kind of innovative activities and examples from um, our context as well. Okay, let me move on to the third part of developing effective ICZ. Mm. Sorry, I think I have to take uh, more than 30 minutes, so. Now it's 12, okay. Let me try to finish it in 10 minutes. All right, um, so there are a few areas that I want to talk about in terms of um, the uh, principles and lessons learned. Uh, so first of it about promoting social inclusion and age uh, segregation, uh, age integration. So when we talk about promoting social inclusion, it is, uh, quite common to assume that this, count, this will counter the social isolation faced by older persons. But as Cocktails Project show, 
loneliness is not just an older person's issue. It can also happen uh, and affect younger people as well. So creating such opportunities for intergenerational interaction can be a naturally occurring inter intervention to enhance a social connectedness for all. So, um, and when we talk about ICZ framework, um, it is does not only considering issues on a personal level, but also seeing it as a community challenge in focusing on the relational, not just how it affects the individual or one generation's position. Then we are shifting from my sense of place to our shared sense of place. In this case, it is to expand one's attention of the capacity of place to a broader sense of community finding a sense of belonging to an age diverse populace. So there are plenty of other chapters in the book that um, also talk about such ideas of social inclusion. For example, uh, Masataka Kuraoka's chapter on Japan, um, the multi-generational cyclic, cyclical support system that's um, being rolled out in Japan. Uh, describes a multifaceted community-based pilot project that's designed to strengthen social networks and support systems in several Tokyo communities. So this involves opening some older adults oriented, they call it salon or cafe community spaces um, to younger adults and children. Um, and it shows that, you know, these spaces when they are reconceptualized as intergenerational rather than just mono-generational settings, then you see um, you know, how they are, the clarification of this reconceptualization and its implications for project planning, site management were key things in how volunteers for um, the programs and the space should be trained and supported for. So there is this sense of when we talk about social inclusion, it's actually also about bringing you know, the mono generational kind of spaces and uh, making it into intergenerational hub uh, that is not just serving older persons, but it's also a space of connecting them to the community. So in that sense, we look at intergenerational, we put an intergenerational twist to aging in place, mantra that's prevalent in literature and practice, and it's often tied to age-friendly cities, communities, movements, and other such endeavors. So we argue that aging in place is not enough. Older people need to be connected to the community here. So they need to be able to age in place without isolation. So, um, and we also see this kind of inclusive environment as consisting of a virtual space. How come this thing is uh, a virtuous, uh, virtual space? So we have one chapter in the book that's by Yu Zhang from, um, from NUS uh, that looks at the virtual environment as intergenerational contact zone and play through digital gaming. Um, and she shows that you know, there are even digital gaming systems that are designed for intergenerational audience. And although it remains in general a novel idea, it can be quite effective in strengthening intergenerate connect, intergenerational connections. Mm, so, for example, one example is uh, the Pokemon Go, right? That um, Pokemon Go is quite unusual because it also requires people to be physically active. So, and we do see the kind of um, family connections or intergenerational connections uh, fostered uh, through, through Pokemon Go and, and some other intergenerational uh, kind of um, activities, um, games. And uh, with COVID, of course, we are talking a lot more about what we can do online to connect the generations. And I don't know if you know about this new uh, initiative it's called uh, Eldira. Uh, there is an online intergenerational mentoring system. I can't remember where was it. It's either being started in the US or started in Europe, um, but it is uh, interesting you no, know, we do see a lot more interesting initiatives that are coming up online um, to have connections, you know, to, to show the potential of this uh, ICZ on a virtual scale as well. Okay, then the other one, um, the other um, 
uh, participant. The other thing I like to talk about is um, this whole idea of participation, choice, and flexibility in an intergenerational community settings and planning. Uh, participation, actually, in all the chapters, almost all the chapters, they talk about participatory framework as very important in trying to um, engage and um, to try to come up with a suitable um, kind of um, programs or communities that um, are ICZ. Um, so the processes are important and increasingly essential, but it's not simply, it's not very simple or not very easy to predict sometimes. So, um, and to be frank, to weave in an intergenerational dimension to planning process can add time and complexity to the process. So, I know, for example, this co-housing example in chapter 15 by, uh, by Zheng, uh, on intergenerational co-housing communities. You know, it actually takes in time for them to figure out um, not just moving in, but moving in with intergenerational concerns of um, the needs of um, all kinds of residents. So um, here the book um, in the method section has some ideas and some suggestions with participatory tools, such as in chapter 24, Eight, um, Stafford talk about map making, and then Sanchez and Stafford in chapter 23 talks about um, the toolkit idea on helping the up to foreground the participation of youth and elders in community planning and to assist them in concretizing the kind of uh, intergenerationally negotiated recommendations to improve intergenerational spaces. Then there's also choice and um, flexibility as one thing. You know, sometimes uh, a lot of you know designers will find out you know, the place we first think of as um, to come together are uh, not always the most welcoming to all. You know, places that we build may not be what people want. So uh, many public and voluntary sector provide a space connected with agenda, for example, to you know direct people towards improving activities. And then we found people, you know, would rather go, go to the supermarkets as an easier place just to be with others. So there's always um, difficulties as in planning as well. People have the choice as well. So it's important to also um, think in terms of um, options, think in terms of how flexible those spaces can be. Then um, the other area, Actually, there are a lot more areas than what I'm going to talk here. But um, the other area that I thought I would just briefly mention is looking at how material culture and social practice can serve as mediators for ICZ space. Uh, in the chapter that I wrote with Yamamoto, uh, we look at Japanese teapot as objects possessing ICZ generating properties. Because uh, in Japan, you know, people, young people actually don't drink from a teapot anymore. A lot of young people in the survey say that they don't even have a teapot at home. They only drink from plastic bottles. So, you know, this whole idea of brewing tea, of waiting time, all this is actually um, not so common among young people. And so, um, well, the, the, the tea manufacturers, of course, partly for the, for the profit um, thinking, to want to, um, they try to, um, promote more of a, you know, using tea leaves, drinking, you know, we're brewing tea leaves at home and so forth. Uh, but we also, and at the same time, we, we also see how a teapot, in fact, has is more than just a teapot drinking, but they really give space and time for conversations, connections, and become the center, you know, when people waiting for tea uh, to be able to drink and so forth. So how it can also promote the kind of family togetherness uh, through an object such as a teapot. And then Suzanne Hammond talks about importance of olive tree, uh, how it functioned as an ICZ entity and symbol in the Palestinian cultural context. So hers is more of an example of um, geopolitical nature and you know, how, how broader forces can endanger ICZ spaces. Then um, it's also important that we have to recognize, I think most important that we have to recognize the obstacles and how, you know, look into ways to transcend the obstacles. Um, among the forms of ICZ spaces, intergenerational set, shared sites are widely recognized as a very effective ICZ space. Um, but at the same time, many of us are given the efficiency and benefits to old and young alike in those shared sites. Why haven't shared sites flourished? Why is it that, you know, we keep telling the intergenerational 
few people keep saying that shared site is the best, but it's so hard to work on it. You know, very few in Singapore, we know that, you know, it's good to connect the generations together, but how many shared sites do we have in Singapore now? We, I think we can count in one finger, one hand, right? So um, so what's the reason? Um, Butts, Donna Butts and Stem did, um, wrote about, um, did a recent paper on the shared sites and they um, say here that, you know, the unfortunate answer is that we haven't made it easy. There are all kinds of obstacles, including multiple accrediting bodies, different standards, narrowly focused funding streams, and the boutique nature of the programs that make it, you know, many well-intent developers may also find that it's too, um, it's not, um, it's not, um, it's profitable enough and things like that. And other important areas, I think we have to really, um, um, Another barrier is that about ageism, you know, that has been around for age long times. But in this chapter 13, um, the authors talk about, you know, we should be resituating age discussions around us as we age, getting the young people to realize that they will age as well, rather than around young versus older people comparisons. Okay, so. Uh, so in conclusion, I'm, I know what I really try to bring out, you know, when we talk about this exploration of ICZ is really, how can we see it as a sensitizing tool? For those of us who plan and operate intergenerational programs, it could be a conceptual vehicle to remind us to pay attention to the role of physical environment in influencing how participants across generations would meet or feel or find opportunity to get to know one another. And for those of us who operate in the areas of environmental design, community planning, development, you know, this whole incisive look into how ICD spaces would function provides a reminder as well as a trigger to consider all other kinds of factors that would affect what takes place in an intergenerational setting and how to be more acceptable to programming in unlikely places as well. And finally, the final question is, is proximity enough for intergenerational engagement? Is proximity enough? Yes, physical proximity as found in age integrated facilities can certainly increase the odds of bringing people together across the generational divide. However, the consensus response from all our, our chapter authors is no, it's not enough. We need more. We need more sensi you know, more sensitivity to all kinds of other issues. We need to cross the barriers and so forth to make it much more common for us in a community to have co-located co kind of services that work. Yes, and COVID-19, of course, is um, making things, it's not making things easy, but I think we can um, ride over, over it. Hopefully we will also have more of uh, online kind of engagements uh, to make intergenerational engagements possible. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, uh, Prof Tang. Uh, I think we have about 20 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a question here. We have a question here by Pei Chun. Uh, you might have talked a bit about, a bit about that post-pandemic uh, situation, but Pei Chun, you want to pose your question? Is it in the chat or? Yeah, it's in the chat. Okay, let me look for the chat. Mm, okay. Uh, okay. Well, I think as I talk about the um in the in the presentation, um, digital space, I think, is really one way that we, we should go. Um, but I think what we have to be aware of is um, digital space does have its limitations and reach, right? So, for example, Eldera, uh, I did talk about how Eldera is, uh, is interesting and it's... Um, you know that uh, yeah, this Eldera um, intergenerational mentoring is very interesting. Um, how it works is uh, where parents will register for their children, so parents will register, and then the children then they will match up with uh, older adults from all over the world. So you have this Korean older 
uh, Korean young kid, you know, um, wanting to be a scientist, hoping to be a scientist, link up with a retired scientist and things like that. So there are exciting uh, things that can happen with this kind of intergenerational connections. But but it will, you know, it has to be in the first place, uh, some uh, children from Africa, children from, you know, some other um, developing country will find very hard to be connected if they don't have parents that are, you know, um, so, um, that know, or know about this program or has internet access and so forth. So there is also the inequity um, issues that we have to handle in um, the digital space. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Or oh, if the, you know, I, I know in the audience there are people from different areas, different um, professional, um, like in from the arts or other or, or other um, areas that you may want to you know share about some things that you all have done intergenerationally kind of engagements or you know some future ideas for uh, more co-located sites and so forth. Or maybe I can ask a question, uh, Prof Tang. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I, I think it's very interesting. You, you talk about, you know, you, you began the talk by saying it's not just programming; it's also the space. Mm. But I think, I suppose the question is, what is the balance between programming and space? Because it, it's not the, it's not the library alone. You know, it's what the library does. Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it's what the library the you know, it's the, the space is just, it's, it's yeah. there, but, but what does the library do, mm. you know, on, on a routine basis to bring different generations together? Yes. Right. So, yes. so I, I think it's some kind of a combination between the space on one hand, yes. but also the programming that goes with it, you know, that, that yes. together provides a powerful combination yeah. for, for that. Yeah. So, okay. So, so we started in the intergenerational field, actually, um, the, the lot of activities were focused on programs. So mm. we talk about, okay, you know, now there's generation gap. How do we bring the old and young together so that there, how do we, um, yeah, how do we um, handle this issue, you know, bridge the gap? So a lot of um, programs started to get funding, you know, when you get funding and mm. say, I want to bridge the generation together, like, I'll do this program for three months. Mm. And then uh, to see how it works. So, and I'll have, um, I'll have evaluation research with it so I can understand the kind of pre and post kind of uh, impact on the old and the young, right? Mm. So, a lot of programs are like that. A lot of research are like that. So, so over time, we gather, we know, oh, okay, that is positive impact, you know, when programs mm. are. But sometimes programs are funded and then they will go away, right? Mm. So, when funding ends and then that's it, that's the end of the program. Mm. So um, program is important. We need to have programs, but at the same time, we need to also see how we expand places from places like libraries, probably, you know, old and young people, probably they are like, um, they go to library, but then they are parallel. Like they do not actually interact with each other because they have different sections, right? Mm. So how do library, for example, if you look at a place, then how from the you know, different dimensions, from the physical side, how can the library kind of... Uh, change the design a little bit so that there mm. is some kind of chance encounters and, and so forth you know with the old and young with different generations so how can things change design or, or mm. physical kind of, um, um, you know sittings or whatever you know that can change to to maybe change that kind of idea that you know it has to be always older people, adults one side, children one side, and things like that. And then on top of that, libraries can have all kinds of programs and how can the programs um, be intergenerational as well? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually, by looking at ICs, by, by using ICZ, I'm just trying to push people to you know, go beyond that idea of a mono function of a place to an intergenerational function. Yeah. Prof, Prof Eileen Wong, I think you have your hand up. Yes, I have. Uh, yes, I like to yeah. think so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
listening to Prof Tan, I'm really very interested in the various kinds of programs and the ideas of uh, how to plan spaces in order mm. to provide the potential, potentiality for interaction. Now, I think the most visible kind of um, expression of, of mm. our concern about intergenerational spaces is the planning of public mm. spaces, okay? Yeah. Now, this, in these public spaces, uh, actually, interaction is supposed to be by chance, to be Mm. to be natural, that people will just interact with each other. Mm, right. uh, but you don't see it happening, even though you co-locate many things together, children's mm. playgrounds, mm. Areas, you know, health station, or, or mm. even a little uh, play equipment in the, those. Now, what strikes us is therefore, how do you help people to understand how to start a conversation across the generations? The like old people will sit there and just observe the young children playing. The young children will be there and see the old people observing them, but they don't really take the first step to talk to each other. I think mm -hmm. attention has to be on this kind of skill, mm -hmm. provided that the old people also want to talk also want to interact. Maybe they don't want to be disturbed. Maybe they just want to watch the mm. world go by. So mm. that's one thing I think we have to pay attention mm. to, how to start a conversation, okay? Mm. Mm. Now then uh, another observation I have is very interesting. I mean, you, you show this thing about the uh, cocktail parties at care mm. home communities. Mm. These are volunteers who are middle-aged people who have time to volunteer. We often think of intergenerational uh, interaction mainly in terms of young people and the seniors. Mm -hmm. We never think of the middle-aged people and the seniors as also intergenerational. And the benefits are both sides, okay? Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you sort of obtain a satisfaction of fulfillment by not just helping the seniors, but also learning from them, learning from some oral history or even some skills and so on and bring home all these takeaways. Mm -hmm. So I think we should broaden our understanding of intergenerational interaction as not just between very young people, children and old people. We can mm -hmm. encourage volunteerism with the intention of increasing intergenerational interaction and, and participation. That's my comment. Yeah, okay. that's great. That's great. Thank you very much, Prof Wong. Um, yes, uh, the first thing about how do you start conversations. Actually, play, playgrounds are very interesting places. You know, in, in Japan, we uh, that's also this... Uh, purposeful ideas of having like, okay, we have playgrounds for children and then you have space for older people with wheelchairs to like, you know, to sit along um, at the outer area of the playground to be with the kids. And for the kids, this is a sense of security, like there's older, there's like adults there watching over them. And, uh, and the, um, the social workers call these adults volunteers, that they are uh, passive volunteers, but they are volunteers. So, so that's interesting in how, uh, um, how sometimes and and there was a a video that talks about you know the older people volunteering just by being there. They don't have to do anything. Just by being there, they bring sense of um, um, so, you know the sense of security to the children that are playing in the playground, and. Um, so starting conversations is not easy. I do see that in my observations in the playground, um, uh, when I, I mean, I was looking at intergenerational, but I accidentally, not accidentally, but I also see like, you know, a lot of inter-ethnic kind of um, interaction as well. And inter-ethnic in a sense, I see children really playing. They don't care whether it's a Indian boy or Malay boy, Chinese boy, they just, you know, play together when they come to this playground. Uh, but then adults are less so, right? Adults don't really interact so much. So adults, if they bring the children here, they will just sit by the side and uh, maybe the same nationality and all may start talking, but not so much with other um, cultural groups. Uh, but we do see like young uh, domestic workers talking with elderly people. So you, we see, you know, things like, young domestic workers or elderly people teaching young domestic workers about a recipe and things like that because they they go to the same place every day in the community then over time they kind of know each other and that kind of relationship um, happens so um, starting a conversation is not easy but I think the middle generation the parents would actually play a part right parents if they go to the playground together with the kids and they could you know and if they always see the same neighbors or same same older people there, then over time, um, they 
relationship could happen with, you know, they will say, tell the kids, oh, call Gong Gong, call Bobo, you know, that sort. And then, and then you can see relationship happening. So it takes time in the first place. And then it's also some consistency of, you know, of going and meeting up um, for various period. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it is, uh, these are really potential intergenerational contact zones area in the community that we should harness and we should, I, you know, in a way to be more purposeful, especially for uh, if we can, you know, I don't know how we can, we can uh, bring these ideas to the residents, but I think those are important for, uh, for a mutual support and for a better and better kind of uh, community bonding um, for everyone. Then the other one about um, the age groups. This is very interesting because when intergenerational programs first started, they are very clear about it has to be 21 years and below interacting with 60 or 65 years and above. So there's this kind of like, oh, it's intergener, it's alternate generational, it's not intergen. And, and to be frank, my journal of intergenerational relationships built on that kind of definition. So we actually do not accept papers, basically do not accept papers that talk about mothers and children, okay, because we want to really focus on the old and the young generations. But uh, over time, we do see changes happening. So there are like, um, there's recently one paper that's um, somebody want, wanting to put in a paper, um, and is working on it to look at how do we um, define this intergeneration? What is intergeneration? You know, can't it be uh, one generation and the other generation? And it, it doesn't have to be like, below 21 and over 65, it could be somewhere in between as well. So, um, and, and gradually, I think we are changing um, and we are trying to grapple with, you know, this, this changes of definition and so forth. Um, but, you know, in the, interge in the generational studies, we have things like generational, um, you know, like this list, there's also groups within generation, right? Within one big generation, you do also have different generations that are, um, that uh, because of this rapid changes in, in society, even a 10 year, 20 years different can be a big difference. Mm -hmm. You know, even the 10 years, right? Something like, like my kid in 20 would say that, oh, 15 years old, I don't understand them, you know? So, so how, how that kind of generation is getting, the, 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 the kind of intergenerational kind of ideas is actually getting uh, smaller in a sense in the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think I agree that, um, uh, we should, on a community basis, especially, we want to, um, we want to promote that kind of cross generational kind of across the spectrum, and not saying that you know when mm -hmm. we look at intergenerational programs, especially in the community, uh, that it has to be only from certain age to certain age. I think we mm -hmm. should be more um, encompassing. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm looking at the the time now, but I think we have uh, time for maybe one last question. Uh, anyone in the audience would like to pose a question? To or to share something. <laughs> yeah, or to share something. Yeah. I, I, uh, I'm so uh, yeah. I'm a uh, hey, uh, Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, in fact, I think your talk gets me very excited about this whole idea of, about, uh, about space and, uh, and, and about the bridging of generations. Actually, I come from the healthcare sector. Mm -hmm. um, I have experience from the social services working in a community. So mm -hmm. currently, uh, I am with one of the acute hospitals here working on population health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, one of the focus in my uh, work is, is on uh, bridging generations because mm -hmm. uh, recently a lot of papers are showing that uh, there's there's in fact a lot of uh, positive health outcomes uh, 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 when 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 the generations uh, uh, interact with each other. But but the but the issue is really uh, is it is really about uh, the way how healthcare professionals tend to think, right? Uh, when it comes to talking about bridging generations, uh, the common train of thought is always. Uh, let's gather a group of uh, youngsters, then send them in to do home visits. Mm -hmm. uh, in in, in uh, to 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 do home visits to the elderly, and mm -hmm. and then the, and the conversation pretty much stops there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, um, so, so, so mm-hmm. I guess in the healthcare sector, we are really to break free from this uh, form of thinking. So I'm not too sure uh, whether, uh, can I get some comment you about this? Mm. So you're saying that, you know, it's always like, okay, we'll get a group of youngsters to go and do home visits and then it stops there. Does it, are you saying that uh, then you don't know whether it's really effective or are you thinking in terms of, um, yeah, how, how effective it is? Um, yeah, I think there is always this question about the effectiveness uh, because uh, a group of youths, when they go in, uh, it is always mm-hmm. for a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. And contact is also uh, quite brief because the group of youths, are, 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 they are not always the same group of youths. Mm-hmm. And they do not always see the same group of mm-hmm. uh, elderly people. Right? So, 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 so that is uh, pretty much one of the one of the limitations, and this is also uh, something that everybody has been doing for quite a while. Mm, 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 uh, doesn't really uh, make, 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 make much of a difference. So when it comes to thinking about spaces, right? Uh, uh, mm. how, how would you recommend uh, a healthcare professional working on uh, population health to to change their uh, way of thinking and to see this, um, yeah, just just something very general, just to get some uh, comments. You okay? So there, there was this like, I mean, to have young people to go visit older people is very common. You know, we do this all the time, right? With all the the schools and all those. And sometimes, if it's just one two visits, it actually has more negative effect because will be so you'll find that how come older people are so different from me you know they cannot speak we cannot communicate because we don't speak the same language and so forth so i do see um i i remember there was this program that uh for uh, secondary school kids to go visit um the older people in uh, rental blocks um so at first they couldn't and it it we wanted it to be more uh, effective in, to be to have an impact so it's like not just one two time but maybe over a period of time so older people, the children went in and at first they really don't know what to talk because, you know, they don't speak dialects. The older mm-hmm. people only speak dialects and things mm-hmm. like that. So there was uh, very little things they could, they could really talk about. Um, and then, but over time, they realized that, oh, maybe we should do some activities together. We don't just go visit them and then we sit there, right? So, mm-hmm. so they, then they started to have activities on the void deck. Uh, the bringing down the older people and then have all kinds of games and, and fun and play. And that really, uh, over time, that was helpful in opening up, you know, both people, both parties in talking. And I think one of the Im- positive impact is that the younger children, the younger secondary school, became more interested in their own grandparents. Then they realized, hey, I should know more about my own grandparents, you know, um, you know from, from knowing about this older people who is a stranger from a stranger uh, so there are um, it helps them to change the idea of um, it actually breaks down the age discrimination as well uh, help them to change to, to look at older people as just an old not just an older people but someone with a history with something that they can share and so forth yeah so um, so yeah we, we can talk more about you know um, this in the after after the talk, but uh, there are uh, really I think advantages in giving it time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why in the past some of the projects don't work for school children because if you're just going for one time, you get shocked and then you know because the older people are so different and then they they if they go in more persistently and building relationship, then that would make a difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, it, it's 15 past, so oh. I think <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank so you. I, I think we should wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much for the talk, and uh, I I really think the question that you know we're all interested is 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 that which you have posed uh, whether proximity is enough, mm-hmm. and, and I think and I think it's as you say right, it's not just the proximity, it's the activities, but the activities also have to be routinized. It has to be mm-hmm. something that's done over time, right? So, so I, I, yeah, I, and not just for intergenerational, but even for inter-class mixing, yes. different kinds of yes. inter, inter-ethnic mixing. Yes. I, don't, I don't think it's a matter of just bringing people together. It's what they yes. do out of that uh, encounter, the relation, and then how the, relation, how the, the relationships become friendships, mm. you know? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anyway, yeah. we can talk some more. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the thank audience you. for your thank participation. You uh, have a good day and see everyone again. Thank you very uh, much. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thank you.